Good evening. This is Judiciary Lecture Number Three. I'm sure you're waiting breathlessly to hear what follows. Uh, frankly, I can't blame you because the uh, the magnificently produced uh, presentation, along with the scintillating lecture lecture style that the uh, host has, I'm sure sets you on uh, on the edge of your seat as you wait for the next uh, jewel of information to uh, to be put in your head. Okay, enough about me. Let's get on with the judiciary. Now, judicial activism is the philosophy that courts should take an active role in solving social, economic, and political problems. Now, normally this is associated with more liberal courts or liberal philosophy, but this isn't all, always necessarily true. And on the, other, the flip side, judicial restraint it's usually associated with conservative philosophy, but not always. So what do we mean by judicial activism? Is that the courts should uphold the guardian ethic, which means that they act as the guardian of the people. And one must wonder, um, is, is that exactly what the founders had in mind? when they gave the judicial branch the powers that they exercised. <coughs> um, and, and so consequently, uh, it, it's a question which makes judicial activism versus judicial restraint really fascinating. Now, what kind of things constitute judicial activism? Well, let's look at eight of these things. Requiring states to provide legal aid for the poor. We know that the justice system is blind as, as it is, still isn't blind, perhaps blind enough. Because people with wealth, rightly or wrongly, are able to exercise better and greater use of the judicial system than those that are poor, who have no representation. So legal aid can range and, and, and uh, be used for things like like criminal, uh, fighting a criminal charge, but more than, than that, they're, they're used to kind of, or legal aid is used to, to try to remedy um, the ills that the poor suffer when dealing with the society around them. Um, when you are poor and helpless, it's much, it's much harder to get some, uh, to get uh, traction on, on, uh, in life so that you can get this, the things out there to, um, that makes you or put you back in, in, a, in, a, in a situation where you can control your own future. Requiring pr prison modernization, many of our prisons, um, our, our state-run prisons, um, have really struggled because money for many years was not was not budgeted to upgrading prisons. And, and certainly, when voters look at at the issue, it's it's you look at prisoners and and you feel as if well, you know what, they're getting what they deserve. But the courts have felt that that there has to be a, a modicum of of a level of care, since these are now wards of the state. You know, we have to be responsible not only for their their well-being, but we also need to house them in um, circumstances that um, a fairly wealthy society can afford to do, and so. Prison modernization means that you have to upgrade medical facilities, uh, things in which you can perhaps um, rehabilitate prisoners, and and but it's mostly infrastructure, you know, um, le to, to lessen things like crowding and, and and such. Requiring states to educate undocumented aliens has meant that, <coughs> excuse me, that states have to spend money on the. Uh, on the children of un, uh, illegal aliens, um, and though you may not want to spend money for people who are here illegally, the the flip side of the issue is, what are you going to do with those kids? Wouldn't it be better to put them into school? And when their parents can resolve their undocumented status, they have some education. Otherwise, they're going to be running the streets. And we know what happens when kids run streets. They get into trouble, and which, which raises crime rates. You can't have it both ways. 
So this is probably a, a better thing. But again, it's the end result of an issue that hasn't been resolved at its root. A political question, establishing the one man one vote principle uh, to reapportionment, which led to, which came, which spawned from Baker v. Carr, and then federal on the federal level, Westbury v. Sanders, is another is another example of judicial activism. This is one of the few first cases, not the few cases, but the first cases that the courts felt um, and knew was a political question, and they were willing to take it on, and came out with a landmark decision. Uh, the the court has struck down the, Gulf, the, the Gun Free School Zones Act, which uh, prohibited people from um, owning firearms and living within a certain distance from schools. Struck down the line item veto in Clinton v. New York. Said the line item veto is fine as long as you amend the Constitution. If you don't amend the Constitution, then the line item veto, at least at the federal level, is unconstitutional. Again, a political question in a way and um, the court resolved it constitutionally. The last two, uh, the court struck down the Florida recount in Bush v. Gore in 2000, and the court has also struck down state death penalties for, for, for the mentally retarded in Atkins v. Virginia in 2002. Now, when if any perpetrator of a crime is considered um, mentally retarded, uh, yes, they will serve time, they just cannot be put to death. So judicial restraint <coughs> is the is an, an approach to making law or dealing with a law, and and it says that the the courts should allow the states and the other two branches of the federal government to solve social, economic, and political problems. After all, those are the people that were elected by the people in order to deal with the problems. And those who support judicial restraint also say that the federal courts should act only in those situations where there are clear constitutional questions. To do otherwise is to essentially act in a way that perhaps the founders never envisioned the judicial branch ever acting in being, in being proactive as much as one can uh, in, in a situation where one can't reach out and grab cases, they have to wait for the cases to come to them. They say that the courts should merely interpret the law rather than make law. But by interpreting law, they simply aren't. They, they, make, they have to make law. By interpreting it uh, in, in, the, in the realm of what is faced by today's society, they are making new law. So it suggests that the courts should follow original intent of the founders, or what's called original intent, and they should decide basis, cases on the basis of what the founders wanted. And the problem with that is they didn't leave us a guide, neither Madison, nor Washington, nor Franklin, or others left us any sort of guide as to what the founders envisioned America would be 230 years into the into the future. But this is also a, a, a philosophy that's been ascendant the last 30 or 40 years in comparison to judicial activism, which was ascendant from the 1930s into the 1970s. Now, historically, um, much like uh, dual federal, federalism versus um, marble, cake, marble cake or cooperative federalism has a dividing line of about 1937, so does judicial activism versus judicial restraint. Prior to 1937, liberals complained about the conservative court being too activist when it struck down reform-minded laws. Uh, for instance, Prior to, nine, prior to the Roosevelt administration, there hadn't been a minimum wage. Uh, child labor was an acceptable form of participation of, by children in the workforce. Uh, the National Recovery Act, the 
Agricultural Adjustment Act had all been overturned by the court as a violation of the, of the government's ability to deal with the situation that it found itself in. So when FDR attempted to pack the court in starting in 1937 and then failed in 1938, his, uh, his pressure to change, to expand the court, actually with a retirement and with a philosophical about, about face by one or two other justices, um, suddenly his New Deal legislation was acceptable, whereas before it had not been acceptable. So now, the conservatives begin to complain that the liberal court was being too activist, especially with the advent of the Warren Court in 1954 through 1969 when Warren, when Warren re, uh, retired. Conservatives begin to complain about the, the court's judicial activism in things like rights of the accused. So, for instance, requiring the police to issue Miranda warnings. And this comes in 1964. Um, civil rights cases. Uh, for instance, uh, those kind of cases which allowed forced busing uh, to achieve school desegregation. So, for instance, what happened in Mecklenburg County uh, in North Carolina, uh, around Mecklenburg surrounds Charlotte. Um, civil liberties when it came to prohibiting prayer in schools. That starts also in uh, 1962 and, and, and goes onwards. <clears throat> So you can see the, the sweep of the, of the court's uh, expansion into being activist from a liberal perspective. And you can also see then why, whereas, why liberals had complained before 1937, why now conservatives were complaining uh, in this, in this uh, especially this post-war period. <clears throat> now, following the Warren Court, was the Burger Court, almost as active as the Warren Court. Um, but again, some landmark cases came out of the court. This is a court that still has uh, on its bench Thurgood Marshall, William O. Douglas, you know, the, the extraordinary people who had uh, supported um, Warren when he was uh, leading the court. And that, that continued with, uh, with Burger. But now with Nixon and then Ford and then Reagan, and that and that stretch only having Carter uh, interrupted, and I don't believe Carter got to name any justices to the bench. The Burger the Burger Court is uh, is kind of the last flower of this liberal period before the ascendant conservatives rise. Now you remember Roe v. Wade is about abortion, and you see Regents v. Backey was about affirmative action. So now we have come full circle. For 19 years, it was the Rehnquist Court. Rehnquist died in 2005, and now it's the Roberts Court. And <clears throat> uh, the liberals are on the warpath again because liberals feel that the court has been overturning liberal precedent. Liberals accuse the court of being excessively activist in this area. And so Again, we turn to some of, the, some of these cases, overturning the Gun-Free School Zones Act. Uh, liberals say, but we're trying to protect children. And, and the conservatives would say, or, the, or those who um, are in favor of judicial restraint would say that um, this is a, an infringement by the federal government on the rights of individuals. Overturning the Florida Supreme Court decisions in the election of 2000. Um, I certainly didn't agree with how the court ruled. The court ruled in Bush v. Gore that, it, that, that, that their decision could only be applied to Bush v. Gore. It didn't apply to any other election, um, which makes it stunningly bizarre in a, a lot of ways. California's Prop 215 that, that legalized the medical use of marijuana was also overturned by the courts as a violation against federal law. So this makes it for an interesting period. And you can see how when you're out of power, you complain about the other side being too activist. So what are the restraints on judicial power? 
Well, the courts can make decisions, but they have no mechanism to enforce them. They have to rely on the executive branch and somewhat the legislative branch to do their bidding. Remember Jackson versus Marshall in 1829, who won that contest? The president. Marshall had to tuck his tail between his legs and grin and bear the decision by, the, by President Jackson to ignore the court's order to not remove the Cherokees to uh, out west. Again, the courts cannot reach out and take cases, but must wait for the cases to come to them, sometimes years. Remember, the president nominates the judges. And, of course, the legislative branch, the Senate, confirms judges. Judges can be removed after being impeached by the House. The trial is held in the Senate, and they can be removed. The president, theoretically with the cooperation of Congress, could increase the number of courts and judges. And that includes the Supreme Court. They have been reluctant to do so. It's costly. But they can increase the type of judges that the, major the majority uh, party wants at the time. And that would, of course, give that majority party's philosophical leanings uh, more, more power, at least until the next cycle comes around. Now, Congress also has some restraints on judicial power. Remember, they can pass constitutional amendments uh, that, that, uh, that contradict the court's orders. So, for instance, um, the court said that flag burning is a constitutional right of um, free expression, free speech. The House has passed at least three amendments to the Constitution, which would ban flag burning. The Senate has just missed uh, complimenting the House's move, so nothing's been done. And I don't believe anything has been, been introduced uh, lately that would have hopes of passing. Um, they can actually repass a law that, that was held to be un unconstitutional in hopes that the Supreme Court will change its mind. That puts enormous political pressure on the court, and they may not rule the same way the second time. Determining the jurisdiction of the courts, what kind of cases the courts can and cannot have. Uh, if you remember from an earlier lecture, uh, how cases dealing with ambassadors have changed uh, in that the, uh, the D.C. federal court now takes, takes on that power and the Supreme Court only uh, holds a trial. I don't think it's happened yet, but, that, but the, the courts can change the jurisdiction, I mean, the uh, legislative branch can change the jurisdiction of the courts. <clears throat> and, of course, um, judges can't spin out of control and rule any way they want because there's the star decisis issue, which means that uh, let the decision stand, or what has happened before, precedent uh, governs the way that... Uh, cases will be handled in the future. Existing laws put a restraint on judicial power. The Constitution puts a restraint on judicial power. So, again, public opinion. You know, the, the Supreme Court probably does not follow the election returns in the short run because the justices were appointed by previous presidents for life terms. In the long run, however, the court will probably reflect public opinion because the justices are appointed by presidents who were elected by the people. And believe me, they do. They do look at the election returns. The court was rather surprised at the, the extremely negative reaction that a majority of Americans had when surveyed over the court's decision in Bush v. Gore. I think they were taken aback by the vitriol of those who opposed the decision. I'm not quite sure that anytime soon the court will interject itself in, in that same manner. On the other hand, time was running short, and uh, and perhaps um, the court didn't necessarily do the right thing, but they didn't necessarily do the wrong thing at the time. <clears throat>